let's get started. We're gonna have a lot of opportunities to interact and hear from each other today. And so I want you to, um, you know, kind of stay ready to do that. And also, as you were already told, if any questions or comments just really come to you during the session, don't hesitate to use the chat function or raise your hand and we'll, um, we'll let you in on the conversation. So this, today's sec session is, um, as you saw, entitled Passion Energizing, Energizes Being an Inspiring Leader in Times of Uncertainty. So when we were thinking about topics for Webinar Wednesdays, I uh, was really drawn to this topic for a real personal reason. There was... Um, a time in my professional career, only one, thankfully, where I can honestly say I was not happy. I was unhappy at work, I was unexcited at work, unenthusiastic, and as a consequence, it took me a while to realize, I wasn't really being very effective, I wasn't being my best self. And I, it wasn't until I realized that I had lost my passion. I had lost, I had lost my touch with my passion. And it was affecting everything, particularly my resilience at work. So I thought it would be a great time now that we are in a situation where more than ever we need to be resilient, we need to be inspired leaders. Um, so I thought I would give you today some tips on discovering or rediscovering your passion at work and also helping others to do the same. So first of all, let's, um, let's talk about um, what we are, um, what we mean by passion. Here's what we know. Passionate leaders Um, but sometimes as, um, as leaders, we kind of get out of touch with our passion and we need to have a way to, um, restore that in us and in others. So here's what we're going to talk about today. Why passion matters in leaders, especially now. I'm going to give you some tips on how to discover your passion at work, which you probably already know what it is, but maybe you could use a refresh. And so we'll talk about some tips for discovering your passion at work, and then how do you cultivate passion in others? I love this quote, a person can succeed at almost anything for which they have unlimited enthusiasm. So I'm curious, use your annotation feature or uh, use your chat feature and tell me, what do you think about this quote? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Does it speak to you in any way? What do you think? You guys have figured it out. So I'm seeing some, um, some people who agree and uh, some responses to this particular quote. If anyone would like to just share with us why this quote really resonates with you, feel free to raise your hand and um, we'll, we'll unmute you and hear what you have to say. And Vicki, while we wait for um, people to use the raise hand feature, um, I have two answers in the chat so far that you'd like me to share. Um, Jordan says, uh, not sure if the enthusiasm ensures success. And Zena says, um, depends upon the people slash obstacles in the way. All right, great points. You know what? Um, so maybe enthusiasm does not necessarily ensure success. Maybe it depends upon if we're in a place where we're well matched, where the work that we're doing is work that we're passionate about. And to Zena's point, we don't have obstacles that we are unable to overcome. All right, anything else worthy there that we want to talk about? 
Uh, we have our very own Don uh, share a quote on enthusiasm. Uh, Light yourself on fire with enthusiasm and the world will come to watch you burn. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. I agree. That is a great quote. Well, if we, um, you know, if we can identify with this notion that enthusiasm and passion um, does have some correlation with our success, let's explore how we can be more passionate as a leader and inspire that in others. Let's move on and talk about why does passion matter at work? And the bottom line is passion, it impacts your performance and it impacts the performance of others. And I saw this personally when I lost touch with my passion. I was not as effective as I could be. I was not my best self. And as a consequence, my team wasn't performing optimally either. So let's talk about the impact on your performance. Here's what we know. Um, passion is generally born out of something that is meaningful to us. And so as a consequence, because it is meaningful to us, it often leads to mastery and success. So if you think about it, you probably work harder at things that you are passionate about than you do at things that are just part of your job, but you don't have a whole lot of passion around them. So being in touch with your passion really does help you to, um, to, to master skills that are important to you and that you're excited about and that you are enthusiastic about using. Passion also influences our daily choices and activities. Whether we are conscious of it or not, it does. But if we are conscious of where our passion is, it really provides perspective and clarity and in many ways for a leader, consistency that's helpful to our team. Which leads us to the last benefit um, that I've listed here of being in touch with your passion and you know, there's a, a lot of reasons that passion is impactful and important element in the workplace. I'm curious, let's use this whiteboard function uh, in our webinar and tell me how have you seen your passion affect your work? More productive, better quality work, a good reason to bring our passion with us to work every day. What else have you seen? How has your passion affected your work? Don't mind working hard? Absolutely. We'll work hard at things we're passionate about, won't we? Keep on going when times are tough. More pride, more excitement. What other thoughts, some responsibilities I don't care for takes so much longer. Isn't that the truth? How to develop others because you like seeing them grow. More efficient. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. And Vicki, while we wait for more, do you mind uh, repeating the last point? You went out just a little bit. Uh, the last point, uh, I think, I think I was just elaborating on what we're seeing on the whiteboard and the, 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 the trends and the themes that we're seeing to me center around we work harder, uh, we're more excited about our work, we produce better work, we have more pride in our work. Got it. Thank you so much, Vicki. And Thank just you. to reiterate how to use the annotate features for future slides, um, I just want to note that if you're using a laptop or desktop on the Zoom window, you'll see a green box that says you're view you are viewing Vicki Kelsey's screen. Next to that is the view options box. You just click on that. There's an annotate function right at the bottom of the uh, space. And as you click on that, there should be options to uh, 
do text, stamps, all that stuff. If you're on the tablet or mobile device, however, the annotate function will show up on the lower left-hand screen of your window in the form of a pencil and circle. That'll save the key screen. So just touch that icon and you should be able to annotate right away. Thank you. I love the responses that we're getting here. Um, Lamont, are there any in the chat boxes that we want to point to? Uh, I just have one to share and it's, uh, we'll do whatever it takes to complete. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when you think about what impact you've identified on your work, think about your team. Wouldn't we all love to have people that work for us that feel this way, that bring this to work each day? All right, let's clear that whiteboard and move on, um, Lamont. Thank you all for your participation on that exercise. I wanna talk a little about how passion, your passion as a leader, impacts the performance of others. Um, your passion elevates the product productivity and employee commitment of others. And there's been a lot of data that supports that statement. Um, Deloitte recently um, did another study, yet another study on employee engagement. And I thought we would look at those numbers just as a point of comparison for a minute when we think about employee commitment. So as indicated by this graphic, there are three types of employees in most normal workplaces. Uh, and one of them is the engaged employee. Um, these are the employees who are very involved at work. They're committed to their role. They're enthusiastic about the overall work experience. Um, you may know what this statistic is, um, but just on a North American study done in 2019, the representative sample of what we would consider engaged employees was 34%. So about a third of employees in typical workplaces would be considered engaged. So that, that leads us to what, what are the rest of these guys doing? And there's another category of employee that we characterize as actively disengaged. They're unhappy with their job, and they're, they let their overall unhappiness happiness push them at work. And most importantly, as a leader, what I was always most concerned with is they spread that negativity to their coworkers. And according to this Deloitte study, about 13%, North American study done in 2019 in a typical workplace, fell into this category of actively disengaged. So if you're doing the math um, in your head, you know that, okay, so that's about half of the workforce. What are we gonna, what are we, you know, gonna call <laughs> these, this other group? Well, there's a group that is not engaged. Now, what does that look like? They're generally satisfied they are fine just showing up and doing the bare minimum. They have no real cognitive or emotional connection to their role or to the workplace. And so if you've done the math, you, you know this is more than half of a typical workforce would fall into this category of not engaged. And, and here's why we care as a leader um, and there's a lot of reasons we care, but really due to their lack of attachment, first of all, they'd accept another role for even a very slight pay raise. But what more often they do is they just, what I call, quit and stay. I've heard some people call this retire in place. Um, what, however you <laughs> sort of refer to them, we've all got a, a phrase that we use when we think about this, this population that you're just not engaged. And as leaders, we all know that they, we, there's consequences for that. 
Um, so let's take a poll. I'm, I'm curious how you think those statistics I just shared compare to your workplace. So there's a poll on your screen. How closely do you feel that these statistics match your world? Is it spot on? Is it not at all? Our workforce is more engaged or are you not really sure? All right, it looks like we've got um, over half of us feel like these statistics are pretty representative of um, the environment that we are leading in right now. Um, raise your hand and let us know if you'd like to comment on that. Lamon, do we have any raised hands? I think we, we don't, but I do have a question. Okay. Um, from Katie. Uh, Katie asks, could you have a worker that falls into the fully engaged group normally, but because of this COVID stay at home telework orders and being at home with other responsibilities, they've lost their robust passion. And you know, part two is how do you help those people? You know what, Katie, that is such an important question. And so the short answer is yes. Uh, the short answer is absolutely. Um, the, the engaged, fully engaged, not engaged, that is a, you could think of that as a continuum and oftentimes employees do kind of drift along that continuum based upon circumstances. And so the first thing I think you do as a leader is um, you do exactly what you're doing and you really raise your own awareness of the situation and you have, have got to kind of create a dialogue with that employee to recognize that they're not a bad employee. Situations have changed. What do you need from me as a leader? When we talk about in a little bit some ways to inspire passion in others, there may be some things that you will see that um, are, are pretty easy things that you can do specifically for that type of employee, that population of employee that um, can, can get them back into that sort of engaged population. That's a great question. Thank you. Any other questions come up, Lamon? Hi, thank you. Not right now. Uh, you can go ahead and move on. Perfect, perfect. Okay, let's clear the poll. All right, so um, effect on engagement is one of the impact that your passion can have on others. Let's look at some other impacts on others. So it elevates productivity and commitment, as we said, your passion also fosters employee commitment to your vision. So as employees get, get further and further away from, um, you know, the key leadership that's setting the vision. So in the hierarchy, as they get further away, it gets more and more important that we as a leader are able to foster commitment to that vision. And if we don't have passion around the work and why it's important, why it's good work and it matters and it makes a difference, then it, it is rather difficult for employees to get on board. <clears throat> so your passion fosters that employee commitment. Your passion also inspires others. No one has ever been inspired by a leader who is not passionate. When you think about great leaders you've had in your past, I would, I would venture to guess there's none of you that said my favorite was because I didn't know what he was passionate about. It just doesn't usually happen that way. So, um, so you are going to inspire others because passion is contagious. Alternatively, the lack of it is also contagious, unfortunately. So that is why we, we really carry the, the mantle for this as leaders. So if you want to have a passionate, inspired workforce, um, here's the newsflash. <laughs> it begins with you. And so, so you, you have to work on yourself. 
was using the analogy of put on your oxygen mask before putting the oxygen mask on your child. It is that important that we focus on ourselves. So that's where we're gonna go next. So the key to being a passionate leader is, is you know, knowing and owning what you're passionate about. I love this guy. He knows exactly what he's passionate about. I don't have any special talents. I'm just passionately curious. And Albert Einstein took his curiosity uh, a lot of places. And so it's important that we know and we're in touch with our passion. So I'm going to take you a little on a little uh, journey and give you some tips on discovering your passion. There are a lot of things you can do, but what I thought we would uh, look at today is, um, first of all, use emotional intelligence, tap into your emotional intelligence, and that can help you to discover or rediscover your passion. Let me tell you a little story about burning down the house. And um, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a great way of thinking about what's important and providing yourself with the insight that you need. And then lastly, we're going to just look briefly at uh, declaring your why. And um, I'm going to give you some, some things you can do after this webinar that will be helpful in that. So this webinar is not intended to, to go into detail on emotional intelligence because that's a whole topic all of its all its own. Many of you have been to classes and we do a lot around emotional intelligence um, in our key classes. And as you know, it is a, both a noun and a verb. Um, the, the noun definition is it is the capacity to be aware of, control, and express one's emotions and to handle interpersonal relationships judiciously and empathetically. And so what I'd like to do is use this model, it's a competency inventory from the Hay Group, to just kind of some reminders, some things that we can do by um, brushing off these competencies. It will help us um, rediscover our passion. So, <clears throat> One of the things, it really starts with self-awareness. And I think particularly right now in this, in this COVID VUCA world, um, it's, it's more important than ever to tap back into yourself and do, a, do an honest inventory of what you need at work during this time. What do you need emotionally, physically, and intellectually, and, and identify those things. And then by doing that and identifying those things, you're um, exercising self-management by identifying some sources of stress. And um, there may be sources of stress or sources of need in any of those areas that would not have even been an issue in our old world. But because we're in a different working environment, and we didn't have a whole lot of time to prepare for it, um, it, it may be that some of our previously established patterns aren't working anymore. And remember, those patterns have also created expectations in others. So just re-examining some of those patterns can be a great way to, to get back in alignment with what matters most. Here's something that I've been recommending to uh, many of my coaching clients, and I think it's a great exercise. And this is an exercise that helps with social awareness in this new world. So I recommend that, um, you know, you, you pick a time during the week and you go on a tour. And so what do I mean by that? Well, take a few minutes and, and consciously increase your awareness and observe some things that you've never noticed before. 
This could be in your weekly staff meeting or touch point, but just look for things that, um, that tell you about um, where people are, what's important to them, um, how they're doing. Some things to look virtually for could be, first of all, I love looking at people's home workspace. It says a lot about what they're dealing with and the way that they're dealing with it. I talked to a client last week and he said, Vicki, I'm in my basement. This is where I can kind of, you know, be by myself when I need to be by myself. It's not the most <laughs> uh, scenic place in my home, but I've made it work. And, and to me, that really spoke to his level of commitment. And so, you know, pay attention to those kinds of things. Notice in your team when different people speak or participate during meetings and the type of interaction, it's probably different than it was when you were having face-to-face -face meetings. So this is not about making assumptions or it's just observing. It's just observing and increasing your social awareness. And then lastly, in this model, um, the last competency is relationship management. And I think that is especially critical in times like, like we are currently facing. Communication methods have changed. They may not be working for everyone. Uh, rhythm of work varies. Um, people are now teaching school during certain hours of the day. And um, some they may be working at hours of the evening or the morning that was not typically their work rhythm. Feelings of an uncertainty can be, can be, you know, amplified. And so I just think that, you know, if you're gonna demonstrate being a passionate leader, you need to be open and curious, be willing to share information about yourself and, um, and also ask meaningful and respectful questions. I'm going to ask you something to do. I'm going to ask you to do something, but it's, you're not going to report out on it. I just want you to take a moment and in your emotional intelligence sort of inventory, are there relationships that need your attention right now? Just make note of them. This is just a good time to think about that employee that I don't ever hear from anymore that used to be highly engaged or, um, you know, that um, single parent that I know is spread really, really thin. Am I, am I really managing that relationship in a, a passionate way so that they can stay inspired? So just take a minute and collect your thoughts around that. The next tool that I want to give you on this um, metaphorical, you know, pull into the side of the road and checking our navigation as it pertains to our passion is this concept of burning down your house. Um, this really resonated with me. I uh, hope it will with you. So I don't know if you're familiar with um, Sir Richard Branson. He's an entrepreneur philanthropist, a very successful businessman. He's, uh, he found, he's the founder of the Virgin Group, which for those of us that are old, we remember that that started with Virgin Records. <laughs> uh, but he also has Virgin Airlines. He's even got cruise lines. Um, what he is really known for um, in leadership circles is he has really mastered um, creating a loyal and engaged workforce. He's written great articles about it and he's a great person to follow if you'd like to um, see examples of what does that look like. But here's what you might not know about Richard Branson. So he had a home on an island, I don't know what island, and during a hurricane a few years ago, it caught fire and burned to the ground. No one was hurt, but that experience 
um, provided him with some insight and a, a tool for really analyzing your purpose, your passion, and what's important to you. And he came up with these questions, which I think are really, really good. Um, if, if you lost everything tomorrow, would you rebuild your home in exactly the same way? And, and I'm thinking of the sort of metaphorical home. Would you fill it with all the same stuff? Would you start your career over and in the exact same way? And this is a great question. Would you recruit all the same people back into your life or work? I'm curious, use the chat box. What, what comes to you as you, as you th think about um, this insight as it applies to your own life? What do you think? What do you think about these questions? Lamon, let me know if we if we uh, if we get some insight. I sure will, Becky. We'll just wait a little bit more for the questions to pour in. <laughs> but in the meantime, uh, we have Christine who says she loves Richard Branson and love these questions. Uh, George, our very own George from Key, said he would avoid mistakes and hazards he's learned from, mm -hmm. I think he'll continue that thought soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've had a lot of people who say that they'll do um, some things differently, um, some that says absolutely not, always in hindsight. Uh, Ariel said definitely would keep some things the same, but definitely make some changes too. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, rebuilding off what I have learned, but keep what was working. Yep. And a lot about reflecting and learning from the past. Yep. Yep. I agree with the the notion that that we we shouldn't live our life looking backward. Absolutely, uh, we're not headed that direction, are we? But uh, the the I think these questions are quite provocative, and um, so it is. Um, there, there. It's a powerful way, in my opinion, to to really challenge yourself to think about what is what is most important. Anything else pop out at you, Lamon? Yes, Jenny said she would take the same career plan, but would definitely make some different choices in the way uh, she handles different people, certain people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And someone says that it, it might be unrealistic to expect to have control of whom is in your office if you take a job with existing staff. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, true, good point. And I think that's all we have for now. I have three more questions, but I can definitely reserve that near the end. Okay, if you think that works better, we'll do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, Richard Branson says, you know, I don't wish it on anyone but sometimes the best way to get clear about what has meaning to you is to just imagine starting over from scratch. And um, given that, I mean, we all know there are, there are some things that you, we don't get a do over, but this is, I think, insight that to me, it, it challenges me and to own my own empowerment for what I can change and what I can impact. All right, so in addition to brushing off our emotional intelligence competencies and burning down the house, the last um, body of work that I, I want you to be aware of when you're thinking about your road to discovering your passion is um, it's the work of Simon Sinek. And you've, you're probably familiar with his work. If you're not, um, he is um, trying to lead a, um, a revolution around inspiring leaders and helping them to inspire others. Um, <clears throat> he um, a, has a lot of TED Talks. They're great. Um, this is one of his most popular books, Start With Why, How Great Leaders Inspire Everyone to Take Action. 
And he uses this very simple graphic to challenge leaders to really think about their purpose. And I believe that purpose is very closely tied with passion. And so he calls this the golden circle. And so in a nutshell, basically uh, starting from the outside of the circle, um, the, the gold circle is what do you do? And this is um, for many leaders, their identity. What do you do is really easy for most people to answer. I'm an analyst, I'm a project manager, I'm a supervisor, I'm a director, I'm an attorney, I'm an architect. Um, but if you think about it, answering what do you do doesn't really say much about your passion and your purpose. So he challenges leaders to dig a little deeper and uh, the next ring on the circle moving inward is how do you do what you do? Again, not a difficult question for most people. I analyze data. I compile facts and figures. I uh, do research. Again, those are pretty tactical and um, don't really speak to the core of who we are as a leader. He believes that that core lies in the center of the circle and is best discovered by really reflecting on the question, why do you do what you do? What's the purpose? And the why should be an answer that inspires you. And because I get paid to do it is probably not <laughs> your most motivating answer. And so he, um, he has provided some questions and you're gonna get these um, when we send the deck out afterwards, but I want you to think about them as we go along here. Um, what attracted you to the career field or role that you're currently in? And if you're honest, do you, you love your work? We can treat this like a whiteboard. I'm just curious your response to those questions. I love my job, the people I work with. Mostly yes, yes and no. Okay, so those are two really good questions to help us get in touch with our why. Love these answers, childhood dreams and passions. All right, let's clear that, uh, those annotations and let's look at the next set of questions. I love the opportunity to assist people in growing and developing. That, that really leads to this next question. What work energizes you that you do in your current role? What energizes you? And are there parts that drain you? And can you articulate what gives you a sense of meaning in your day and your work? Oh, I would, I am so with you guys on the draining part, the paper, the admin, the notes. What are some of the things that give you meaning? Helping others, seeing others happen, coming, finding solutions, working with others, facilitating growth. So can you see how this is helping you peel down to your why? It's not what you do, it's why you do it. Okay, awesome. Let's clear that and I have one more set of questions for you. What elements might you begin to appreciate if you looked at them from a different perspective? And what, what would you like to change? I'd love to see your thoughts. My job. <laughs> Stale leaders. Uh, miss everybody. Oh, I love that different perspective. Hierarchy can sometimes be necessary. Yep. Mm hmm. Let me telework full time. 
I don't miss being in the office. Interesting, interesting. So I hope you can see that these questions, if you take them seriously and, and you and you really do ponder them, um, they're really great questions to help you get in, you know, back in touch with, why are you passionate about what you do? I love it, I love it. Okay, so let's clear that. Thank you for your participation. You guys are awesome. These are the questions that you're gonna get in your deck. They're the ones we just went over. I just think they're, they're critical questions to ponder and they really will help you to you know, kind of focus or refocus. And the other thing you get from this is by thinking about it in this way, you're equipping yourself to articulate to others in a different way. And that's where we're going next is um, how do we inspire passion in others? But, but at the end of the day, we lead who we are and we cannot create what we have not become. So if we are not passionate, not willing to share our passion about work that we do, then we really don't have a right to complain if we have a dispassionate workforce. Leadership is an inside job. So let's spend the last few minutes together talking about cultivating passion in others and then we will um, we'll have some time for some questions. I have a few tips for cultivating passion in others. Um, pretty simple, just, just things to raise your awareness around. The first one is, um, I think it's important that you be willing to share. Be open about things you're passionate about and ways that this has shaped your decisions and contributions. Be a role model for pursuing and publicly owning your purpose. And, um, and share it in a personal way um, in addition to sharing via social media, which is easy to do, um, don't forget the lost art of speaking to each other and having that kind of sharing. Everyone has a life. And I strongly believe that the strongest teams um, they know each other's life. Doesn't mean they do life together. We don't have to do life together. But um, your, your highest performing teams typically know something about each other on a personal level. And so as a leader, you can encourage that. The next tip is to encourage pursuing your passion in your team. Provide opportunities for team members to publicly pursue their passion whenever possible. Um, help others to see the relationship between passion and their inherent gifts and talents. And if you know more about your team, you're probably gonna be in a position to um, offer them opportunities that they will be passionate about. But that does lead to the last tip, and that's acknowledge that not everything that we do is the most fun thing we do. There is still admin, there is still paperwork, still has to get done. So uh, being an inspiring leader is not being Santa Claus and letting us just eat the chocolate all day long, but it is, um, it's, it's a level of caring. All right, so here's those tips. We'll be sending those to you. I'd like to get some best practices on the board. How do you inspire passion in your team? Let's see some of your thoughts or hear them if you wanna put them in the chat box or raise your hand. Transparency is a great way to inspire passion. 
I love that. Laugh together. Being myself, uh-huh. Setting realistic expectations, I love that. Optimism, investing in them as people. Make large and small group discussions, offering a safe environment. Oh, I love that. Share something outside of work at the end of the meeting. Great tips, easy to do, right? Building in time to get to know each other, make sure people feel heard. Empathize, is that what we're writing? About comments, are we seeing any? Hi, Vicki. Yes, uh, we have uh, to engage with others and encourage. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Building trust. Wellness checks, I love that. You may see something on here that you realize I haven't done that in a while. I, sh I, should, I should do that again. Celebrate with them. Love it. I'd like to move on so that we have plenty of time for questions. I have some resources I would like to share with you. Oh, I love the stamps. The stamps are awesome. All right, let's clear that, Lamont. And let me... Um, I'd like to share with you just a few resources that um, that might be helpful to you if this is a topic that you really are serious about paying attention to. So I, we did a little brief emotional intelligence um, refresh, but if you um, don't have a really good resource for emotional intelligence, that book, Emotional Intelligence 2.0, there's a lot of books on the market and they're all excellent. What I love about that one is it is a what to do and how to do rather than a why to do. So it is less about why this is so important and more about if this is something you want to work on, here are some strategies. So that's a great book. The second book listed there is Work is Love Made Visible, Finding Your Purpose from the World's Greatest Thought Leaders. The name you probably recognize um, in that list is uh, Marshall Goldsmith, but they're all great. And this is a book of essays written by a number of leaders. The Richard Branson story that I, get, that I shared with you came from this book. And he wrote a whole chapter on um, finding your purpose. And it's a, it's a good read, it's an easy read, and I recommend it. And then Simon Sinek's book is there that I had already mentioned to you, Start With Why. Um, he's written more than just one book, but th that's a, a staple. And then here are some blogs and articles that I thought you might find interesting. The Deloitte statistics that I gave you came from that white paper. If you love them, set them free. The link is there for you. Um, David Spungen, Activate Yourself to Crush Mediocracy. He has a really great blog and he focuses on the VUCA leader. And um, he's got some great tips on leadership behaviors. Uh, you might find him of interest. Uh, Brene Brown, Dare to Lead, is, um, um, she's got some great TED Talks. She writes a blog. She's got some books. Um, and um, she's got um, content that I think is helpful in finding your passion. And then the last, um, one there, fewer emails, more dialogue. This is a neat, um, it's kind of a case study actually. It's a neat article um, that tells the story of an organization and how fewer emails, less technology, and more conversation and dialogue, um, the result that it had in increasing creativity and innovation in the office. It's a great read. So there's just a few resources I thought might be helpful to you. So I'd like to take a few minutes and uh, open it up to your thoughts or questions. So I will let Lamon facilitate that. 
Yes. Hi, Vicki. I have three so far that I wanted to share with you. But before that, uh, there was a comment that someone shared about how um, they work to live, not live to work. So they are in the minority. Most people's identity is caught up with their career choices. Mm -hmm. Work is just what they do for a salary that allows them to do other things with their life, like spend time with friends and family, travel, cook, read, eat out, and visit cultural and natural places. Yeah, that's a great perspective. That's mm -hmm. such a healthy perspective. Yes. I love it. And we have one question, and this is more speaking to someone middle in middle management or leadership. They ask, um, what do you recommend for someone that is in what you probably call middle management or leadership that, that and those above who don't have passion or believe in your mission? And no matter how much passion you have, upper leadership's negative attitudes have passed on to your employees. So um, there's a couple of ways to answer that. Um, the first one is probably the least um, realistic option, and but it's, it needs to be said. Um, sort of examine where you're at and decide if um, it is the best match for you. Not all of us can are in a place where we can, can do that. So here's the more in the moment answer to that. And, you know, we can, if, if upper management is not supportive of our passion, we, as, as middle management leaders, have to make a decision to, to not let let not let those leaders take on our passion. It's ours. We're not going to give that up. And so it's about thinking about your approach, thinking about how you communicate with that leader. Um, let me give you a perfect example. Maybe not perfect. Let me give you an example. <laughs> so I, um, I'm very open with my passion and my creativity. I think that it inspires people. It inspires me. I once worked for a leader who had a dramatically different style than I did. She was happy with results that we generated, but I remember her telling me once in a performance review, I would come into her office with ideas and want to talk about a, and put them on a whiteboard and want to have a vision session. And that scared the bejesus out of her. And she told me in a performance review once, you've got to stop coming in here with those half-baked ideas. And so the feedback to me was, my process is different than your process. Doesn't mean yours is right, mine's right. It just means that I can still be passionate, but I don't, um, I don't necessarily have to share it with you in the same way. And I don't know if that's helpful or not, but I think the best way to live and thrive in that environment is to own your own communication style and think about how maybe I could communicate differently that would resonate with that leader. That was a long answer. I'm sorry, Lamont. No worries, Vicki. Thank you so much. Uh, I have just one more, and that is for Marcus. How would you recommend delivering messaging to inspire a workforce as to not get stale? Uh, he, they feel like the longer you are in a leadership role, the more you have to think of ways to deliver and show passion while not getting stale to the team members. Marcus, that is an outstanding question, and it is actually a question question that's founded in um, some interesting data. When we, when we think about emotional intelligence, self-awareness, social awareness, all of those things, interestingly, leaders get better at emotional intelligence historically as they move through leadership roles until they get to a certain level, which is kind of like an executive level. And what we've seen, interestingly, is emotional intelligence growth 
tends to level off or decline when you get up into those top leadership roles. So what that says to me in response to your question is, we may have lost touch. It may be stale because we've lost touch with ourselves and we're not taking the time to observe our audience to get smarter about what kind of messaging they're lacking or they need. Um, and, and we're falling back on standard messaging that has worked with, for us for years. We're not being innovative. So my recommendation would be to start with self and kind of do an honest assessment of how how have I demonstrated uh, a willingness to, to change my communication style? I hope that makes sense. Thank you so much, Vicki. And we have one last one, uh, and this is in regards to how people are engaged in some aspects of their job, quote, doing what they'd like to do, unquote, but don't perform well slash pay attention to other aspects. What to do? We can't only have people do what they like. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So um, if you, um, there's an interesting, um, it's on YouTube, it's a TED Talk um, by Dan Pink. And Dan Pink is a leader that, that uh, in the field of uh, motivation and employee engagement, that um, very intentionally and purposefully carved out time and told employees during this specific time, you have autonomy to work on what you feel passionate about. And, um, and, and then they had fun ways of measuring and reporting out and things like that. But the interesting thing about this case study, by defining it, putting parameters around it, they found that their productivity level and their output in all areas increased. So what that says to me is, no, you don't get, you don't, as leaders, we're not going to tell employees you only have to work on what you like, but we are going to um, kind of value what it is they're really good at and what they really, really like and make sure that they get affirmation for that. And because it may be that that's lacking a little bit for them. And that's why they just keep gravitating to what they like to do or what they think they do well. The other work doesn't go away. And so I think that's a great question. And I don't, I hope that that tip is, is helpful. If you want to know more about it, I'm going to give you my contact information and uh, we can talk more about it. But that's one idea that comes to mind for me. Thank you, Vicki. You're and welcome. Uh, if you have any questions so far, please be sure to send it in the chat or use the raise uh, hand feature in your participants window. Um, and in the meantime, I'm going to list out just one comment from Dawn, our very own Dawn at Key. Uh, she recommended a good book on servant leadership. Uh, mm -hmm. It's called Love Works, Seven Timeless Principles for Effective Leaders. Oh, I love that. I'm going to look at it. I haven't read that one. Um, I'll, send out, uh, I'll send out the title to you later. And uh, Vicki, just to uh, reiterate, so that the case study or the book is called Drive by Daniel Pink. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yes. Any other comments or questions, Lamont? Not right now. We're still waiting for a bit more. I mean, I think you covered a lot of amazing concepts so far, Vicki. Uh, and we've had a lot of just amazing words of gratitude for you as well. Well, I hope it was helpful. Um, it's always uh, good for me to, to press the pause button 
put, put the foot on the brake as my uh, road analogy was and, and um, reevaluate where we are on some of these things. Mm -hmm. So I think that's all we have for now, Vicki. Um, again, if you have any questions or comments, please be sure to share with us. And if not, uh, Vicki will give you her contact information there. So thank you, everyone. You guys were an amazingly interactive group using this technology. So I appreciate that very much. It made the session more enjoyable for me.